where the fun begins. How long before you can make the jump to light speed? Take a few moments to get the coordinates from the Navi computer. Are you kidding? The rate they're gaining? Traveling through hyperspace ain't like dust and crops, boy. Without precise calculations, we'd fly right through a star or bounce too close to a supernova and then an injured trip real quick, wouldn't it? What are the odds of flying through a star or bouncing too close to a supernova? I don't know. We don't actually have spaceships that can travel that fast. Well, what if we did? What are the odds of hitting a star near us? Traveling through hyperspace ain't like dust and crops, boy. Look, I'm unfamiliar with the stars in a galaxy far, far away, but I am familiar with the stars in our galaxy, especially the ones near Earth. All right, kid, but you better be right about this. Han waited to jump to hyperspace due to the supposed risk of hitting a star, even though there was risk not jumping and being destroyed by the enemy spaceships pursuing him. Watch your mouth, kid, or you'll find yourself floating home. Would you stop him with the quotes? Absolutely, your worship. Today, we're gonna use star charts to calculate the actual probability of hitting a nearby star. That way, we know the risk in case someday it actually becomes relevant to us. But enough talk, punch it, Chewie. Oh my goodness, why are we doing this? Come on, Chewie. Wait, why am I Chewbacca now? Well, you're sitting in the right spot. We'll discuss this after the intro. Ah, fine. But enough talk, more data. It's data time! I'm data. So today, we're gonna to be looking at the stars near Earth and the odds that a faster than light spaceship might actually hit one. But in Star Wars, the Millennium Falcon isn't traveling through space, it's traveling through hyperspace. Isn't hyperspace an alternate dimension where the mass shadow of large objects like stars from our universe would have an effect on ships navigating through the gravity well of this alternate universe? Look, I don't know anything about fictitious hyperspace, but I do know about actual space. Let's take a look at our actual solar system. Stay sharp, kid. Here's where the fun begins. The Morgan Keenan system is a classification used to categorize stars based on their temperature. Our sun is classified as a G-class yellow dwarf. It burns hydrogen with a surface temperature of about 5,700 Kelvin. It has a radius of about 700,000 kilometers and is on the smaller end of classifications for main sequence stars. Wait, what's a main sequence star? All stars go through a lifespan of birth, main sequence, old age, death, and remnant. About 90% of the stars in the universe are in their main sequence phase of life, burning hydrogen and fusing it into helium. All right, so see, there are a lot of big stars in the galaxy that Han could have hit. It was good for him to hold off jumping. Case closed. Punch it, Chewie. You keep saying that. Where do you think it is we're gonna go? Destiny. Let's look at the stars within five parsecs of us. A parsec? Like the Kessel Run? You've never heard of the Millennium Falcon? Should I have? It's a ship that made the Kessel Run in less than 12 parsecs. Han got that wrong too. A parsec is not a measurement of speed, but distance. One parsec is equivalent to the distance it takes light to travel in about three years. So five parsecs is the equivalent of about 16 light years. Within that distance from Earth, we find there are 71 stars in our neighborhood. The largest of which is about twice the size of our sun and the smallest is about 150 times smaller than our sun. Our sun is actually quite large for our neighborhood. Out of the 71 stars in this region, the sun is the fifth largest. Within this neighborhood, there are 49 solar systems. Wait, you just said there were 71. There are 71 stars. Aren't solar systems around stars? Yes, but many solar systems have more than one star at their center. That's one thing Star Wars did get right. Earlier in the movie, we see two suns setting on Luke's home planet. His planet is part of a binary solar system. The 71 stars in our neighborhood are found in 49 star systems. 34 of these stars are in single star systems. 22 are in binary systems with two stars orbiting each other. And 15 are in trinary systems with three stars orbiting each other. Okay, so there are a bunch of stars near Earth that Han could have hit. Han shot first, punch it, Chewie. Oh, I feel like punching someone. Let's first look at the concern of bouncing too close to a supernova. How many supernovae are there near us? Well, actually, in our neighborhood, there aren't any. The nearest giant is Pollux, which is 34 light years away. The nearest supergiant is Betelgeuse, which is 400 light years away. Both are far outside our 16 light year neighborhood. In fact, every star in our neighborhood is classified as a dwarf star. If Han had jumped from Earth, he would not have been able to hit a supernova in our neighborhood. 
even if he tried. Okay, fine, but he could have still hit one of the smaller stars that are closer to us. Okay, let's first look at our nearest neighbor, Alpha Centauri. Alpha Centauri is about four light years away from Earth. It is a trinary star system, which means it's made up of three stars. Rigel Cantaris, which is slightly larger than the Sun, Ptolemon, which is slightly smaller than the Sun, and Proxima Centauri, which is a tenth the size of the Sun. Of these three stars, Rigel Cantaris is the largest, and it's only about 8% larger than our own Sun. Oh, Han could have totally hit that. Well, let's put that into perspective. Let's say that Rigel Cantaris is the size of a tennis ball. Then the distance from Earth to it is about 3,700 kilometers. That's the same distance from the Santa Monica Pier in California to Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C. Why does the sand feel like dog poop? Imagine traveling from the Santa Monica Pier across the entire U.S. in a straight line and then accidentally stumbling across a tennis ball in Washington, D.C. The odds of doing this are incredibly small. Oh, it actually is dog poop. Haven't we sent spaceships out of our solar system? Yes, we have. The most distant object we've ever launched into space is Voyager 1. Voyager 1 launched in 1977, over 44 years ago, and left our solar system a decade ago. Currently, it's traveled about 2 billion kilometers from Earth, which is over two light hours away. Remember, our nearest neighboring solar system, Alpha Centauri, is over four light years away. That means that if Voyager had been traveling towards Alpha Centauri, it would still need to go about 17,000 times longer before it reached that solar system. Given that it has already traveled for 44 years, that would mean that if it continued to travel at the same velocity, it would take another 700,000 years to get there. To put that into perspective, if we were traveling from the end of the Santa Monica Pier to the U.S. Capitol building in Washington, D.C., we would have only traveled about 200 meters. We wouldn't have even left the pier. And that would have been after 44 years of travel. It would help if I got out and pushed. Captain Soda. Captain Soda. Good morning. Okay, fine, but there are plenty of other nearby stars we could hit. You said that there were over 70 stars nearby. Right. So let's take a look at the odds of hitting any neighboring star. The closer a star is, and the larger a star is, the more likely it is that we can hit it. Imagine a small object close to you, and a large object far away from you. Depending on the difference of size and distance, it might actually be just as easy to hit one over the other. We can see this with our moon and sun. During an eclipse, the moon covers the sun completely, even though the moon is significantly closer to us than the sun. The same phenomenon is pertinent to our problem. Stars that are larger and closer are more likely to be hit than smaller stars that are farther away. Previously, we discovered that our sun is larger than most nearby stars, and obviously it is closer than any other star. So it is the most likely star that we would hit. If we imagine that we are firing laser beams from Earth in all random directions, the odds that one of them would intersect the sun is one in 180,000. Han would have to be a pretty bad pilot to point the Millennium Falcon directly into the sun before jumping. Right. So let's ignore that star and look at the other stars in our neighborhood. If we sum up the odds of hitting one of our closest 71 stars, we find that the odds of hitting any of these stars is one in three quadrillion. Great shot, kid. That was one in a million. Not a million, three quadrillion. That's a thousand trillions. That's a three followed by 15 zeros. That's more than the number of cells in the human body. The odds of a meteor hitting your home is more likely than the Millennium Falcon hitting one of these stars. These odds are incredibly small. You could say astronomically small, no pun intended. No, that's not a figurative use of the phrase. That's where the word astronomical comes from. Things in space are just way more vast than we can comprehend here on our tiny Earth. Just look up at the night sky. There is so much dark and so little light. Now, let's remove all of the stars that are far away and only look at the remaining nearby stars. Look how empty it all is. We would have to hit one of those little white dots in order to have a collision. 
I think it's pretty conclusive to say that Han should have jumped. His odds of accidentally hitting a nearby star were far less than being shot down by the Empire. He should have jumped out of danger, and then he would have had plenty of time to calculate the trip to his destination. That's really what the navigational calculations are for, traveling to your desired star, not avoiding others. Avoiding stars is easy. Targeting one is difficult. Never tell me the odds. Well, that's true. Han never really seems interested in the odds. Sir, the possibility of successfully navigating an asteroid field is approximately 3,720 to 1. Never tell me the odds. So maybe this is just another example of how Han doesn't understand good risk assessment. But you can't blame all this on Han. Other science fiction stories have made similar claims. Yes. Battlestar Galactica had the same problem when they were traveling through space. They also talked about the dangers of accidentally hitting a star when traveling faster than light. We're off in our calculations by even a few degrees. We could end up in the middle of the sun. Again, I don't know what the stars in Battlestar Galactica look like, but I suspect it's the same thing. Hitting a star is really hard to do. Okay, fine. I guess Han should have jumped. Look. Star Wars is a great movie. When it comes to science fiction, I can't speak to the fiction, but I can speak to the science. And the science says that the odds of hitting a star within five parsecs of Earth is one in three quadrillion. So, what did we learn today? If you find yourself the captain of an interstellar spaceship being fired on by a galactic empire and you have the option to jump randomly out of there but are worried that you might accidentally bump into another star, Jump. Always. No question. Jump. Jump! Now punch it, Chewie! Okay, fine.